and with uh, convex geometry. Um, oh, good. okay, sorry. Yeah, so, um, so hopefully uh, I will say a little bit about this relation today. Right, so before I say what is symplectic geometry, let me tell you a little bit about the origins, which are Hamiltonian dynamics. So in Hamiltonian dynamics, we study phase spaces, which are typically R2n. Uh, we think of n of the coordinates as representing position of a certain particle, and the other n are the momentum. On such spaces, we look at function, functions, h uh, to r. We call them Hamiltonian functions. They represent energies of mechanical systems. Um, so you can think of them as like, for example, a sum of kinetic energy and potential energy. So here I wrote the energy function for a harmonic oscillator, just as an example. Um, once you have such a function that basically tells you what is your physical system, you can write down a system of ODEs called Hamilton's equations. And then if you solve these ODEs, you get uh, a flow called Hamiltonian flow. And this flow basically represents the physical motion of your system. Now, if you look at this R2n, you can identify it with a Cn. And then you can uh, kind of think of your position coordinates as real coordinates and the momentum as imaginary. And now in this language, uh, your Hamiltonian is a function from Cn to R. So this function now can look like this. Um, but Hamilton's equation take a, a nice form. So basically, the physical motion is generated by the gradient of the function h rotated by 90 degrees when you multiply it by the complex. Right. Now, in symplectic geometry, we look at more general phase spaces than uh, R2n. So we would look at 2n dimensional manifolds, for example, the two sphere. Uh, but now we don't have uh, the coordinates uh, that we had in R2n. So we need some other structure to tell us how to write the ODEs. And this is done by a symplectic form. So the symplectic form omega basically encodes the uh, kind of position momentum pairing on the manifold M. But now we can play uh, the same game. So we would have a function from m to r. Using this function and omega, we can write uh, ODEs. Their solution is a Hamiltonian flow. So in this example, h is the height function on the sphere. And the, the, the flow it generates is just a rotation around z axis. OK, um, so now that we have dynamics, we can ask many dynamical questions. One object that we like to study is periodic orbits. So periodic orbits are simply points in the phase spaces or in, in the manifold M that return to themselves after some time. Uh, there are many questions you can ask about periodic orbits. You can ask, do they exist? Uh, you can ask how many there are. If you decided you don't have enough, you can ask, can I create periodic orbits via perturbation of the flow or of this generating function H? Right. Um, so the first two questions are kind of the subject of a lot of work in, in symplectic geometry. But today I want to focus on the third one, which was originally asked by Poincaré and is motivated by a famous theorem of his, uh, which is Poincaré recurrence theorem. So I'm going to state Poincaré recurrence theorem in kind of a symplectic setting, but it holds in a much more general setting. Uh, so for us, uh, suppose you have a closed manifold, symplectic manifold M, you have an open set, you can think of it as a small neighborhood of a point, and you have a Hamiltonian flow. So, the theorem will tell you that a generic point in this open set, if you just flow it with the flow, it will come back to the open set uh, after some large enough time. So basically, points generically tend to come back arbitrarily close to, to the original point. So all around your manifold, you have this, uh, this picture of, of almost closed orbits. And now it's kind of natural to ask, looking at this picture, can we just change a little bit the flow to close up this orbit into an actual periodic orbit? So this was the question by Poincaré, can we perturb the flow to create a periodic orbit passing through the open set view? Um, answers to the question depend heavily on what you mean by perturb. So what regularity of perturbations you allow. Uh, if you just look at the vector field generating the flow, and you take some local coordinates here and you just try to force it by hand to close up, what you get is a C0 perturbation of the vector field generating the flow. So this is easy. If you want C1 perturbations, that's already hard uh, and was achieved in a sequence of works from the 60s uh, to the 80s. Uh, these works were given the name closing notes because you close up almost closed orbits. 
Um, now you can ask, okay, what about CK for uh, larger K? Well, there is a surprising counterexample by Hermann from 91 that tells you that you cannot do it with C infinity perturbations. That's actually CK for K large enough. So you cannot close up orbits with high regularity uh, perturbations. And this, these examples lie in, they exist in any dimension from four and up. Um, so now what about dimension two? Well, there is maybe even more surprising positive result from 2015 by Erie and Asawaka Erie. They basically say that, uh, yes, you can produce periodic orbits with C infinity perturbations in dimension two. Um, they actually prove something stronger than that. So they prove that it's enough to perturb your flow in the open set U, which is kind of what you would expect if you try to do it by hand. Um, so again, what they show is that there are, they basically show there are plenty of, of, of perturbations that are C infinity small supported in this open set that will produce periodic orbits passing through the open set. Okay. Um, this list kind of makes it look like the C infinity question of the closing, these closing limits is, is close, um, but that's not really the case. So Herman writes in his paper that uh, basically his examples are weird. So his examples are not weird as smooth manifolds. They're just even dimensional tori, but as symplectic manifolds, they are very weird. They're not quotient of the R2N that I showed you in the second slide. Um, so basically he asks in the paper whether the, this closing property holds for more sane symplectic manifolds. Um, so now this, this is the question we basically want to study. We want to understand kind of if this closing phenomena exists in higher dimensions and, you know, if there is a condition that will guarantee it. One strategy to, to try to, you know, kind of walk in the path towards such an understanding is to look at some basic class of flows and see if you can prove this closing property for, for the basic class of flows, just as a starting point. So this was uh, initiated or asked by a conjecture of Erie. So Erie conjectured that uh, the strong closing lemma holds for the following extremely simple flows. So you just have CN, you look at it as a, you know, you have the C factors, and then you rotate each C factor with a speed that is determined by some coefficient. Um, these set of the class of flows admit two extreme behaviors. So uh, if all of the coefficients are rational, then every point comes back to itself after time, which is exactly something like the least common multiple of these coefficients, right? So all of the points are periodic everywhere you have periodic points. Um, the other extreme is when these, AN, they, these AIs are rationally independent. And in this case, periodic orbits lie only on the um, complex axis. So basically you have a lot of space in which you don't have any periodic orbits passing. Um, so what Erie is asking basically is if, if he gives you an open set here, can you change the flow here in a C infinity manner to produce a periodic orbit passing there? Um, so the answer is yes, and this is a result of a joint work with uh, Chaitas, Dana, and Prasad. So we basically show that there is there are plenty of C infinity locally supported perturbations that give you periodic orbit passing through this region. Um, but now that you know you have this phenomena for some simple flows, you can ask, okay, how wide it, is it? Can we can we prove it for you know a wider class of flows? And also, can we try to at least guess a, a condition that tells us you know, something meaningful about whether this phenomena holds or not. So we have, you know, this positive result in higher dimensions. We have Herman's counterexample. Where is the wall between them? Um, the Bertolomé phenomenon too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You stay in the class of Hamiltonian flows. That's important. If you would allow some plectic uh, maps, then the Herman counterexample would not be a counterexample. So it's important that you stay in the class of Hamiltonian flows. Right, um, so in a joint work in progress with Chaitas, we proved the following statement. So assume the symplectic manifold is something that is called rational. I will say what it is in a moment. Then we prove a strong closing lemma for flows that are uh, C0 nearly periodic. So I will say what both of these things are. So starting with rational, formally, it means that the differential form omega represents a rational cohomology class. But that's not what's important to know about it. What's important to know about this condition is that it holds trivially in dimension two, and it does not hold in Herman's counterexample. So if you try to change Herman's counterexample 
Like if you would take something similar to this thing, but with a rational class, then it would not be a counterexample. Um, so this potentially is relevant to the question. We don't know. Um, C, being C0 nearly periodic basically means that the flow is generated by a Hamiltonian that is C0 approximated by other Hamiltonians who generate a periodic flow, okay? Um, so this is C0 on the level of the generating function. It's like a C minus one on the level of the vector field generating. Um, this theorem kind of wants to be a bootstrap strap from C infinity, C0 to C infinity, but it's not that because, so what we ask is that your C0 close to a completely periodic uh, uh, flow. And then we can give you a C, C infinity perturbation that creates a periodic orbit. If it would be enough for us that your C0 is close to something that has a periodic orbit, this would solve the whole question and also contradict Hermann Kepler example up to this rational thing. Okay, so this is the, the theorem. What are examples of, of such you know, C0 nearly periodic flows? Well, uh, the flows from Erie conjecture satisfy this condition. This is a consequence of the Dirichlet simultaneous approximation theorem. Uh, but you have plenty of other examples, like uh, any Hamiltonian TK, TK action satisfies this. Um, and there are also some more interesting dynamically um, maps uh, that were constructed by Anusa Kutal. Okay, so I think I have, I don't know how much time I have left. I have left some, two minutes or something. Yeah. Okay, so in the two minutes well, that I have. Also, the trouble is beginning to get set through. Okay. <laughs> So in the two or three minutes that I have left, I want to say a few words about the geometric tools that we use to study these dynamical questions. Um, so the idea is the following. We have dynamics. We have a manifold and we have a flow on the manifold. We want to study the flow. The idea is basically to construct a higher dimensional complex manifold. I wrote here, it's almost complex, but you can just think of it as a slight generalization of actually complex. So we will construct a manifold of dimension 2n plus 2 in which kind of two n of the dimensions correspond to m. Another dimension is like time, so it keeps track of the flow. And then the last dimension is the complex conjugate of the time, right? So uh, basically the horizontal plane here is the mapping torus of the time one map of this flow. So now we have this uh, two n plus two dimensional complex manifold. Uh, the two n plus two is the real dimension of this complex manifold. We can study complex submanifolds of complex dimension one. So these would be surfaces in this manifold. Um, these are also called holomorphic curves. Why do we want to study such uh, manifolds? Well, the reason is that for nice enough such submanifolds, the asymptotics of the, the surface are going to be in correspondence with the periodic orbits. So this is basically due to the fact that the complex structure on this higher dimensional manifold um, kind of sees the, the flow. Um, it's, it's kind of a result of the pairing of a non-compact direction with the flow direction. Okay. So the idea of, you know, kind of a, a very general and, and useful scheme in symplectic geometry is you have some dynamics, you translate the, the problem into studying some uh, one-dimensional submanifold in a complex manifold, you use some tools from complex geometry, some moduli spaces, and then uh, you get some information that you then translate back again to, to understand periodic orbits, right? So I think that's all I want to say. Stop here. Any questions? So you believe it's true for all the flows? This perturbation is hard. I don't know. I used to believe it, but now I'm not sure. <laughs> nice question. Yeah. Are, are there any known C0 periodic flows which are not like Kata construction flavored things or S1 actions? I don't know of, of, of any. So that's, I think, a, an interesting question that I don't know the answer to. Is basically all of the examples that we have for things that are. C0 nearly periodic are also higher regularity nearly periodic. Um, and I don't know, I think it would be interesting to understand if it's like necessarily the case or we're just not like creative enough with our examples. Sorry, I missed, I missed, 
Uh, you're talking about symplectic flows. About Hamiltonian flows, yeah. Hamiltonian it's flows. Okay. Even more than six. Yeah, I missed yeah. What's the reference to the non Hamiltonian flows. Yeah, yeah. So it's certainly not, you don't get anything like vector fields. For smooth vector fields, no. Um, we can say something about Hamiltonian perturbations of a symplectic vector field. So, yeah. Um. There's a question. Okay, so let's take off.